What can happen when societies decouple from the Western liberal tradition and adopt collectivist frameworks that abandon reason, the pursuit of truth, and the core principles of civilization? If this is true, if this civilization is indeed a type of apotheosis of so many good things in history and in the world of ideas, then those of us who have benefited from that have an obligation to defend it from all comers. On this episode of Liberty Curious, I was joined by Samuel Gregg, Distinguished Fellow in Political Economy at AIER, to discuss the life and ideas of Wilhelm Röpke. Röpke was a 20th century economics professor who was exiled from Germany in the 1930s for defending liberty and opposing the National Socialists. That's particularly apropos for our own time because I think it's very difficult to understand the significance and depth of liberty without being appreciative of that civilizational background. And that, I think, is what really motivated him, because he talks about this all the time in books and articles that he wrote before, during, and after the Second World War. In the conversation you're about to hear, Sam tells Röpke's incredible life story and describes the humanist philosophy that Röpke lived by, which left him standing alone against the illiberal Nazi regime. They personified what Röpke called the reigning illiberalism, which was characterized by hot air, slogans, glorification of direct action, violence in dealing with all those of different opinion, rabble-rousing in every sphere, empty rhetoric, and deceitful stage effects. Such illiberalism would, he said, trample down the garden of European civilization. That, eventually, was what National Socialism did, epitomized by the regime's attempt to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure to check it out on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, and let us know what you think in the comments below. So, who was this man? Well, Wilhelm Robke was a free market economist uh, who was born in the late 1890s and died in the uh, mid-1960s. He's famous for many things. He was, for example, one of the intellectual architects of the German economic miracle after the Second World War, which involved liberalizing the German economy. He was widely perceived to be the, the intellectual father of that great success in economic liberty. Uh, he's also known because he was a fierce uh, a fierce opponent of national socialism right from the very beginning. And he gave speeches the very week that the National Socialists were elected, to, well, came to power and uh, paid a price for that. He went into exile. Uh, he it ended up living in Switzerland. If the Germans had invaded Switzerland, there's no doubt that he would have ended up uh, being cut off to a concentration camp. But he's also significant in the sense that he's a major figure in 20th, 20th century uh, classical liberal thought for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that he's a particular type of classical liberal. He was very insistent upon rooting this movement for freedom, for markets, for limited government. All these, He wanted to institute all these things in this broad, Western civilizational tradition. And by that, he means a couple of things. He means, first of all, the, the heritage from the Greek and Roman world. He means uh, Judaism and Christianity. He was himself uh, a practicing Lutheran Christian. But he also meant uh, certain forms of enlightenment thought. And he had here in mind reference points like Alexis de Tocqueville, the great 19th century classical liberal thinker, as well as um, uh, people like Lord Acton. Uh, but he was also very interested in, in the, the Scottish Enlightenment and the ideas of people like Adam Smith, um, David Hume, and others who had made such a profound contribution to the emergence of a particular type of Enlightenment thinking that was very different to, say, the Enlightenment thinking of figures like uh, Voltaire and Rousseau. Uh, so he was also one of the people involved in founding the Mont Pelerin Society, a major 
uh, movement of um, classical liberal thinkers that was formed by F.A. Hayek after the Second World War to combat the, the move towards collectivism. Uh, but so this is the type of cl classical liberalism that he was interested in developing. And it's interesting because it takes tradition seriously. It doesn't involve breaking away from the heritage of the West. In fact, he sees classical liberalism in this sense as a type of epitome of all the good things that Western civilization has produced. I should also mention that he was one of the first people to articulate very strong critiques of John Maynard Keynes, the welfare state, and the reliance upon of governments after the Second World War upon uh, full employment policies to try and uh, build better societies. And he said this is going to end up producing... Um, what, what Alexis de Tocqueville called soft despotism because of the growth of the welfare state, but also at some point it's going to produce a major, major inflationary breakout. And it turned out that he was exactly right. That's exactly what happened in the future. So I would summarize him as a Renaissance man, a uh, typical product of a German upper middle class background of the early 20th century, learned in languages, both ancient and modern, able to talk about any number of disciplines outside his own area of economics. Very interested in questions like the relationship between economics and law. As you mentioned, he was uh, very much uh, influenced by the Austrian school of economics, but he was also interested by schools of thought that were interested in focusing upon the legal and political structure within which markets operated. Uh, and of course, we should remember he was courageous in his resistance to the National Socialists, even before the National Socialists came to power in 1933. And he was a hardline cold warrior after the Second World War. He had no illusions about Marxism. He had no illusions about the communist regimes in, in um, the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and places like Maoist China. And that was at a time when a lot of intellectuals were inclined to downplay just how bad these regimes were. So he wrote extensively on questions of culture and economics, law and economics, the way that politics fitted together with economics. And so to that extent, I think he provides us with a model, I would argue, of how classical liberals uh, today uh, should operate at a time in which they're often tempted to, to pretend that this rich cultural heritage somehow doesn't matter, that somehow this, this rich heritage is something that's a, a type of optional extra rather than being essential for the development of a free society. And so to that extent, he and F.A. Hayek are on the same page because Hayek is famous for saying that if he said something like a free society is paradoxically enough a society that tends to be bound by tradition. And that, I think, is very similar to the way that Rob Key thought about these matters. So he um, had a kind of philosophical or, you know, maybe an ideological shift coming out of the First World War, which he fought in. So what happened there? After he came out of the war as a young man, what did he what did he see? What did he think? And how did how did his ideas change? So Rocky came, as I mentioned, from an upper middle class background, and he fought in the Kaiser's army in the First World War. He was very young, eighteen years old. Imagine an eighteen year old uh, man, and you're off to the Western Front fighting in the trenches. Um, he was awarded the, the highest medal, what for Americans would regard as the Congressional Medal of Honor. So he was a bona fide war hero. He even looked like the arch archetype Aryan that the Nazis, so blonde hair, blue eyes. He was an athlete. Um, he was, a, as I said, a bona fide war hero. Uh, and he came back from the First World War initially thinking well, um, first of all, war is bad, <laughs> seriously bad. We want to try and avoid it as much as possible. He also came back as a sort of mild social democrat. He thought that uh, capitalism had failed. He shared the diagnosis of a lot of people at the time uh, 
that somehow capitalism was responsible for the outbreak of the First World War. That was something that quite a few people who later became convinced classical liberals held. So Hayek, for example, came back from his own time in the trenches, uh, in this his case, northern Italy, uh, in the Austro-Hungarian army. He came back calling himself a sort of mild social democrat. Hmm. But both Ropke and Hayek had a type of intellectual conversion as a consequence of reading Ludwig von Mises' book on socialism. And this was a book that basically argued that socialism couldn't work. It couldn't work primarily because it had no replacement for the free price mechanism. And this really convinced people like Hayek, but also Robke, that socialism was bound to fail. He also noticed that many of the proposals that the socialists were advancing in post-war uh, Germany were clearly inimicable to, to freedom. So um, that is the sort of intellectual conversion that he had. So he went off to university after coming back from the First World War, uh, very quickly got his doctorate, and was at one point the youngest professor in Germany. He was 26 years old when he became a professor. Now, as you know, Kate, in Germany, they're obsessed with <laughs> academic titles and academic positions. So the fact that he was appointed a full professor at the age of 26 sort of really established him as a major reference point, for, certainly for economic policy debate uh, after the First World War, in which he consistently argued the case for markets, economic liberty, a free price mechanism, and a pretty tough stance against inflation. So things changed, though, eventually with the rise of the Nazis when the Nazis came to power. Um, and so you wrote, Hitler never made any secret of his intention to strike against those he saw as his enemies once his grip on power had been consolidated. It was thus at considerable personal risk that a young German economics professor delivered a public lecture in Frankfurt am Main just eight days after Hitler took office, in which he made clear his opposition to the new government. So in what ways did Röpke make his opposition clear? Well, I should mention that uh, in the years before the rise of the National Socialists to power, Röpke did something very unusual for a a professor in Germany, he actually went and knocked on people's doors, giving them leaflets, explaining why it was a very bad idea to vote for the National Socialists. He was doing this in 1929, 1930, 1931, where Germany was going through these constant elections. And he was absolutely clear that, yes, communists are seriously bad and the National Socialists are just as bad as the communists. So he was, you know, very public in, in activism, so to speak, against the National Socialists. And he gave speeches going into the 1932 election and in the period between the 1932 election and the point where, he, where the Nazis are invited to serve in the government when Hitler becomes chancellor. He's very vocal in saying these people will destroy liberal constitutionalism in Germany. Do not say that you have not been forewarned. And so he gave this speech literally eight days after Hitler is appointed chancellor, explaining that uh, this is a very dark day for Germany, and here are some of the things that I predict these people will do, and that's exactly how things turned out. And as a consequence of this speech, as well as his long record of criticizing the Nazis, he was basically pushed out of his academic position and went into exile, so to speak, in late 1933. Now, the Nazis made a major effort to try and recruit him to their cause. As I mentioned before, he was the arch archetype uh, Aryan Superman that the Nazis uh, <laughs> tended to extol. He had the right hair color, the right eye color. He was a tall, athletic fellow. Um, he was recognized internationally as a major economic thinker, when it came to issues of trade, inflation, employment. So he was someone they really wanted on their side. And he could have basically, if he'd swapped sides and embraced the regime, as a good number of professors did, he could have had a very successful uh, career under the Nazi regime. Because remember, he wasn't Jewish, 
So they, 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 that, that, of course, was a, to be Jewish in Germany was uh, effectively under the Nazi regime to be a non-person. You could not go anywhere as a Jew in Nazi Germany except uh, eventually to death camps. So he had nothing that really uh, restrained to him from becoming part of the regime except for the fact that he believed these people were evil and his principles would not allow him to compromise with these people. So his record as a, of, of activism, his record of writing against their ideas, and also his critique of their economic positions marked him out as someone who the Nazis were determined to basically either seduce or to push out of public life. And that's exactly what they did. They pushed him out of public life very quickly. Uh, and then he went into exile, which uh, he didn't find particularly pleasant, but he thought he really had no option if he wanted to avoid being co-opted by the regime. So this goes beyond his economic ideas. He yes. had a certain uh, a moral standard which he held himself to, I guess, that, that made it so that he had to tell what he thought was the truth and he had to uh, oppose oppose this regime. How do you think that his his kind of humanism, his background, his religion, all of the things that made up who he was? How do you think that this uh, gave him some some energy and some courage to do this kind of thing and to put everything on the line? Well, I think he saw himself as someone who was saying that. All those background influences that you just mentioned, they constitute the essence of what's unfashionable today to call Western civilization. For him, this was something very real. And the rise of ideologies on the left and the right, he understood as threatening this very delicate civilization that he thought was in a way, a type of epitome of the great achievements of the West. In fact, it's interesting, when he initially went to the, to, um, uh, the Netherlands after leaving Germany, he was there for about a couple of months, then went to England, where he met John Maynard Keynes for the first time. But in 1933, he ended up taking a position at the University of, uh, of Istanbul in Turkey. He was invited, like a lot of German exiles, by Kamel Ataturk to basically set up and modern, modernize the University of Istanbul. So he spent between 1933 and 1936 living in Turkey. And he says in several places in correspondence, but also in articles written later in life, that he realized at this point, because he was living in a society that was not Western, it was certainly modernizing, but it was not a Western society. And he started to look around and say, well, now I start to see really what makes the West the West as a consequence of living in a society that was that was not part of the West for obvious reasons. And so that very much clarified his thinking and got him thinking about what is it that makes the West the West. And if this is true, if this civilization is indeed a, a type of apotheosis of so many good things in history and in the world of ideas, then those of us who have benefited from that have an obligation to defend it from all comers, whether it's from the left or from uh, the right. And again, as I, I think that's particularly apropos for our own time because I think it's very difficult to understand the, the significance and depth of liberty without being appreciative of that civilizational background. And that, I think, is what really motivated him, because he talks about this all the time in books and articles that he wrote before, during and after the Second World War. So you wrote again in your article, Robke's lecture However, the lecture you were talking about earlier went beyond listing all the deep problems with the Nazi movement. He also sought to identify the essence of what the highly ideological movements of the right and left, then striving for power across Europe, wanted to annihilate. So this is backing what you're saying here. 
Here we come to the second dimension of Robke's lecture, his defense of liberalism. So how did he see liberalism? How did he define it? And how did it contrast to the Nazi vision? So I'm glad you asked that because liberalism, the word itself, means a lot of different things to different people. So in the United States, liberal basically means, in most people's minds, people who are in favor of extensive government intervention in the economy, as well as um, a a range of views on any number of social and, and cultural questions. That's very different from how liberalism was understood in um, Europe at the time, as well as how Ropke himself understood liberalism. Liberalism, to his mind, was not about extensive government intervention in the economy. This is one of the reasons he was so critical of Keynes, because he thought that Keynes, by arguing for this type of intervention in the economy, had in a way corrupted liberalism, because Keynes considered himself to be a liberal. Keynes was not a, not a socialist. Keynes was not uh, what we would call a member, a, a Tory or a conservative. Keynes understood himself to be a liberal. Oh. And Robke also understood himself to be a liberal, but liberalism meant something very, very different to him compared to the way that people like Keynes understood it, as well as a lot of American liberals or progressives, I think is perhaps a better way of describing them, did uh, from the early 20th century onwards. So liberalism was for Robke about a couple of things. One, it was about obviously liberty, liberty in the sense of freedom from unjust constraint to pursue the goals that one sees as fit and as worthy of oneself. So that implies a certain sense that liberty doesn't operate outside a moral framework, that liberty uh, is directed in certain ways by who we are, what we as- what we should aspire, what we ought to be doing with our freedom. This is an older conception of liberty, which I think is often lost sight of today. So that's one dimension. Another dimension of his thinking about what constituted liberalism was a commitment to reason, a commitment to using our reason not just to understand uh, how to measure things, how to compute things, not just scientific or empirical reason, but he means reason as the philosophical search for truth. So that's another dimension. And by truth, he means more than just empirical truth. He means philosophical truth. He means the truth about who human beings are and their, their, their type of destiny. And he also thought liberalism also meant humanism. Now, by humanism, we should understand here, he's not talking about rejecting um, the religious traditions, for example, of the West. He sees those as part of this broad humanistic enterprise that that draws upon the Greek world, the, the Jewish and the Christian world, and as we have mentioned before, particular strands of Enlightenment thinking, particularly what you might call the moderate Enlightenment associated with people like Montesquieu, people like Adam Smith, people like David Hume, uh, people like Thomas Reed, uh, people like John Locke, etc. He sees all that as constituting humanism. So liberty, reason, humanism, these are the essence of what Robke be- believed it meant to be a liberal, certainly in the context of the Europe that he was familiar with. So one of the things that I had read, which he said about um, humanism in the context of economics, was that one of his critiques of Keynes was that he saw humans as being cogs in the economic Mm -hmm. machine, whereas that takes away from the fact that every human is an individual with a soul, and they are what makes up the market order. They are what makes up... Um, that whole thing, and they're and they're not just cogs in a machine. So, um, do you think that you know Keynes kind of won the battle now, and we're in this place where people are thought of as cogs in the machine in the economic mm-hmm. sense, and you know more broadly in in the ideological or philosophical sense? Like, has this contributed to the kind of decline of of civilization that we see around us? So when 
Grobke thinks about economics. As I mentioned, he was heavily influenced by the Austrian school of economics, which takes the individual as the starting point of economic inquiry. And by the individual, we're thinking of someone who, um, who makes choices, who has freedom, who's not perfect, who can't know everything, uh, individuals who need to interact with other individuals if they're to flourish economically or otherwise. So in that sense, uh, economics, as Robke understood it, was this type of humanistic enterprise. He called it old economics. And mm. by new economics, what he meant was the type of economic thought that Keynes, or more precisely, his, apost his, um, his apostles and disciples uh, propagated uh, after the Second World War, whereby economics becomes very heavily focused upon the macro dimension, whereby you think about big aggregates of things rather than bottom-up processes, where you have a sense that if you know certain things as a consequence of, of, of the Keynesian way of thinking about economics, then governments are in a position to basically pull levers and direct the economy in particular ways. And that's what I think he means by humans being reduced to being cogs in machine because it involves forgetting that these people are all quite different. They all have very different interests. They have different subjective appreciations of what they think is in their economic interest, etc. And Keynesianism, as Rob Key understood it, basically eliminated that from the way that people thought about economics. So I think like, to a certain extent, like F.A. Hayek, he didn't really believe in uh, macroeconomics. He, for him, economics was about the micro dimension, starting with the individual and working its way from the bottom up. So what is the civilizational consequences of this? Well, it moves away the individual out of the picture and replaces the individual with these big aggregates. It also means that the government assumes a major role in the economy beyond things like ensuring national security, protecting private property rights and up upholding rule of law. And that particular thing I just mentioned, a rule of law is very important because for Rob Key, this was the essence, in many respects, the essence of what it meant to live in a Western humanistic civilization. And uh, once government gets distracted from that or is encouraged to neglect it or even violate it in, the, in order to promote these, these big goals like um, uh, a guaranteed employment for everyone, uh, a big welfare state that will take care of everyone, he was very worried that the extent to which um, the new economics didn't seem to understand the long-term importance of rule of law in order to try and realize these big goals. That was his concern about how he thought that this, this new economics associated with Keynesianism would undermine some very important institutional bulwarks of Western civilization, particularly private property, and rule of law. So you see here, this is the connection he's making between developments in economics and developments on the cultural and civilizational level. And that's something we don't hear a lot of economists talking about today. Right. And he was one of the people talking about this as Hayek, as you were saying. And I think that there's another connection that can be made there as well between economics um, and this kind of collectivist kind of thinking that, you know, mm -hmm. the cogs in the machine kind of model. Um, and, and that's why you can't separate economic freedom from personal freedom. Like there are many dimensions to it. And, and I don't think many people look at it that way. They look at the economy as something that's very abstract and very far yes. away without realizing that it has to do with every single thing that happens in their lives. Um, so, I'll, I'll give you an example from your essay, which comes back a little bit into Robke's story. Um, so another way of looking at people in terms of group is mm -hmm. dividing them by class as the Marxists yes. or, or by race. So you wrote, it was no coincidence that the National Socialists submerged everything into the Volgemeinschaft people's community, folk community, or racial community. For the Nazis, what mattered was the group, 
in their case, the racial collective. Yes. So can you untangle that a little bit? Well, uh, Volksgemeinschaft, as, as you just mentioned, means people's community. This was an idea that was floating around before the Nazis. It was very much part of the way that ethno-nationalist Germans um, thought about the world, uh, that there were these communities of people that were defined primarily not by language, but by by race, by belonging to the German people. You belong to the German people by virtue, or, or more broadly, the Aryan people, as the Nazis said, by virtue of your race, by which they mean essentially genetics. Uh, and so that meant that your individuality was not so important. What meant what mattered was the development and progress and supremacy of that particular community over other communities. Uh, in, in the case of the Nazis, the, most obviously they meant the Jews. They viewed the Jews as a distinct ethno, ethno ethnic group, a, a distinct type of community that in to their mind embodied ideas and beliefs and practices that were foreign and destructive of uh, the German people's community. So it's almost like they saw the, the Jews as a type of disease, a type of vermin that needed to be expelled from the German people's community. And initially that took the form of um, essentially isolating Jews from the rest of German society in Germany, uh, eventually expelling as many Jews as they could from the German land mass, so to speak, as they used to talk about it, and eventually to try and you know purge the Jewish people from <laughs> from the, uh, the the planet Earth. So that's the type of thinking that uh, preoccupied the Nazi regime. You can certainly find this very easily if you just read enough of Hitler's speeches. This is the way that they talked and thought about the world. And identity was everything. So your group identity was everything. It triumphed over your individual characteristics. Uh, you were expected to sacrifice yourself for the prolongation of the people's community, um, your particular interests, your particular family, your particular priorities were not important. What mattered was group identity. Now, we can see similar types of thinking on the left, right, at, at both at the time and in the present, because in the past it meant it was all about class, right? Your class trumped everything. Your class identity trumped everything. So if you were, you really wanted in the Nazi, in the, in the Marxist world to be a member of the proletariat, because that was the group that really mattered for, uh, for Marxists and the bourgeois and other social groups were to be um, dismantled. And if, if not, if not assimilated into the, the people's uh, workers' paradise, you would be expelled or even uh, marginalized. Uh, today, we see a great deal of emphasis upon identity as the core to how we should understand ourselves. We find this, for example, in um, the DEI movement. We find it in ESG where what matters when it comes to that, that word I don't like using anymore, diversity, diversity is not about your individuality. Diversity is about which group you belong to or which groups you belong to. And there are in-groups and there are out-groups. So Robke was particularly perturbed by this emphasis upon the group over the individual. And for him, it wasn't, didn't really matter whether it was about the racial group or the class group or whatever group it happened to be. He thought that the moment you get into the business of elevating group identity over everything else in society, then you have a problem. Now, he didn't deny that there were, there was a group called the Germans or a group called the French or the Americans. He said, you know, nations are, for, to his mind, were just part of the natural uh, the natural world in which, the natural social world in which we existed and was defined very much by things like language, where people had lived for per particular periods of time, etc. He wasn't denying that there are distinct nations. His problem was when these types of identities were elevated above everything else and which were used in a way to see anything that 
didn't fit a particular model of what a nation is supposed to be like, um, anything that, that didn't fit the model, the idea that that had to be crushed or expelled or in the case of the Jews, exterminated, he found that clearly antithetical to what he meant by liberalism in this broad sense of the word. So he also wrote about, for liberty, it meant more than being free. Yes. Uh, it also meant being free for something. Mm -hmm. And that something was nothing less than civilization, the very air without which we cannot breathe. So he, you continue to write, liberty in this sense thus went together with what Robke called a belief in reason, which you spoke about before, and reason properly understood for Robke far exceeded empirical rationality and utility calculations, as you said. Ultimately, reason concerned the absolute pursuit of truth. If societies wanted to be free, they had to accept reason as the common denominator. So in this world now, you know, what you're just describing here, everybody looking through things in terms of group identities, how does that detract us from the pursuit of truth? Well, truth is classically defined as the mind's apprehension of reality. So uh, the capacity of our mind to understand the truth about the reality in which we live, the truth about who we are as human persons, and what that truth about us being human persons means in terms of how we use our freedom. So for Rob Key, his conception of liberty is decidedly anti-relativistic. So this is very important because for him, as, as you mentioned, reason it includes empirical reason, it includes scientific reason, but it also includes the reasons why we do science in the first place. We just don't do science or economics or, um, or study art or any number of these things um, just for random reasons. For him, the reason that we, we study these things to try and understand these things is because we're interested in truth. Otherwise, why would we bother to do it in the first place? It's like the doctor. Why does a doctor engage in medical research or why does a doctor engage in helping patients to recover their health? Well, it's because they regard health in itself as being a good thing for human beings or they regard the truth, the truth about medical science or what, 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 what we're trying to understand when we pursue scientific research. It makes no sense to do these things unless we have some type of a priori commitment to the idea that there is truth and that we can know it. And that truth goes beyond what we can measure, truth goes beyond what um, science tells us. The whole scientific enterprise for people like Robke was based on the idea that it's good to know the truth and that truth is always to be preferred to falsehood. We should always prefer to know the truth about the fact that the world is a sphere rather than flat, that it's good to know the truth about um, the nature of the human person and how our will relates to reason, all these types of philosophical questions rather than being clouded in ignorance and falsehood. So for Rob Key, this idea of civilization ultimately comes down to this idea that there is truth, that we can know it, and that we can choose it, because that's the ultimate importance of our liberty, that we can choose these truths to pursue the truth and also live these truths in the way that we carry out our daily lives. So that's sort of the ultimate horizons to which Rob Key is looking, and it's very characteristic of a good deal of classical liberal thought from the late 18th century onwards. You know, they're, they're, they're really trying to inquire into the full truth about things and to make us aware of different falsehoods that may be out there, whether the economic falsehoods, cultural falsehoods, etc. So for him, civilization has this distinctive anti-relativist thing. Truth for him is not about what you feel. Truth is not about um, my perspective versus your perspective. The notion that there is my truth and your truth, he would have found completely ridiculous. There's simply the truth. 
And that's what he thinks ultimately civilizations are built on. And it's their commitment to that on which civilizations will stand and which civilizations will fall. The moment you move away from this concern for truth, he argued, in favor of something like a will to power, which is what we see with the Nazis and with mm -hmm. the Marxists, then you're in trouble. So also, you know, there's something interesting in there as well, because we do live in a world that is morally relativistic. And, and, and partly that stems from, you know, a certain kind of strain of enlightenment thinking even, you know, in the empirical way of trying to measure everything and be able to prove everything. And you're saying Robke is going beyond that to say there is a tangible truth that exists uh, that goes beyond uh, these kind of empirical ways that you measure truth. So one example uh, would be that the Nazis were the bad guys. In the, yes. in the in the situation that unfolded, mm -hmm. right? Like that's, you know, and... Yes. So, so how, are, how do you conclude that? that? Yeah. Right, right. So how so do you conclude exactly that? Point, right? So you can't, unless you have some type of a priori commitment to that there is truth and that we can know it, then you can't know that the Nazis are seriously bad people. You can't know that... Uh, Marxists are also seriously bad people because notions of good and evil don't matter anymore in a world in which we consider these things to be relativistic, that it's about my opinion versus your opinion versus everyone else's opinion. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have disagreement. We obviously do have disagreement about uh, pre prevailing in different societies about what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil. And that's always been the case. But the fact that there is disagreement doesn't prove that there isn't truth. All it proves is that people disagree or that some people are wrong about certain things. So for Robke, the moment you move beyond a commitment to this wider conception of truth, which includes empirical truth, which includes scientific truth, but to his mind has to include philosophical truth, the moment you move away from that, then it becomes very difficult to critique the, the, the actions and choices of people who do seriously wrong things, because who am I to judge, right? If there is no truth, who am I to judge the actions and choices of other people? So that's why I think he, he took this idea of truth so seriously because it enabled, it, it, if you don't have the conception of truth, then you can't identify true threats to civilizational growth. But I think that one of the problems with this and why people have difficulty with it, I mean, we can see this unfolding in our world right now. And we also saw it back then during the Nazi regime. The, the, the people, the masses who were behind the regime believed that they knew the truth. Mm -hmm. That's right they knew what was good. Right. So this is, this is the challenge, right? It's always been the challenge. And the challenge is, okay, once you establish that something is true, what does this mean for the way you make laws or the way in which you construct um, government or the policies that you embark upon? So, so um, the, the worry, of course, is that the person who is committed to truth is likely to basically move in the direction of suppressing other people's liberty in the name of that particular truth. Now, that has certainly happened at different points of history. It happened in the ancient world, in the medieval world. It happened in um, stages of history like the French Revolution, etc., whereby a group of people are absolutely convinced that they know the truth about something and that it's in everyone's interest that they get on board with that truth. So that's a genuine challenge. The, the classical liberal answer to that, the limited government conservative answer to that, is to say, yes, of course, there are disagreements about these sorts of things, which is why we need particular institutions, be they constitutional, political or economic institutions in place, that stop us from moving in the direction of essentially establishing some type of dictatorship based upon uh, people's conception of 
the truth. Now, that said, I think it's also the case that unless you have some sort of commitment to truth, then the types of rights that we think are important for maintaining freedom in a given society themselves need to actually be based upon something called truth, Um, whether it's the right to political liberty or the right to free speech. These things are based on the notion that the pursuit of truth is actually important and needs to be protected. And we give these this constitutional form or political form in the expression of different types of rights. So my point is that, yes, this can be a challenge, but this also is why you need to ground particular institutions on the idea that um, pursuit of knowledge of, is good, health is good, work is good, uh, family is good, and that you need certain protections so that any one particular group, when it happens to be in power, can't override these types of things. So truth in this sense not only creates um, the, the, the enterprise of seeking for what is the truth about the world, this concern for truth, it also puts down principled barriers for people taking one aspect of the truth and then trying to ram it down everyone else's throat. So it creates space for people to debate these things. But here's the other thing. There are some truths that every single society has recognized. There is no society in the world that says that stealing is good. There is no society in the world that says it's good to despise your parents. There's no culture in the world that says murder qua murder is a good thing. So there are these truths that all human beings can know. And part of the challenge, I think, is to establish um, foundations or criteria by which all people, whether they are um, whatever side of the political spectrum they're on, whether they're a religious uh, believer or a religious non-believer, that they can all recognize as providing foundations for agreeing upon the truth of something. And for Rupke and others, that was ultimately about reason. They had great faith in the capacity of human beings to know these truths, whatever cultural society that they lived in. Now, they also believed that humans were limited, that they couldn't know everything about everything. And so it was very important to have constitutional checks in place to make sure that human fallibility was taken account of. But that's perfectly consistent, I believe, with a concern for truth and the types of institutions that we want if we want to live in a society in which freedom is based upon certain principles rather than the whims of particular groups at particular points in time, which being whims can be easily overturned or crushed by anyone who just takes the idea that the only truth there is is the will to power and I'm going to use it. So that brings me back to thinking about these mass movements who believe Mm -hmm. that they have the truth, that they're looking at the truth um, and their will to power and their Mm -hmm. will to exercise that power to do terrible things. Why is it, Sam, that mass mobs lose their ability to reason? Well, uh, Rupke had a lot of thoughts about that um, because he saw that literally in the streets every day, particularly among young people. So at the university that he taught at, the University of Marburg, uh, which had long had a reputation for being um, a major uni- European university, one in which uh, the sciences, the humanities, philosophy, all these other disciplines had flourished. Uh, most of the students at his own university uh, were committed national socialists. So a lot of young people after the First World War found themselves drawn uh, to these types of movements, both on the right, but also on the left. So why do people get interested in these things? One is because they're dissatisfied with the status quo. Now, if you're a German in 1920s Germany, especially early 1920s Germany, you're likely, you're probably likely to be dissatisfied with the status quo. If you're a young person, you're probably looking around and saying, what future do I have in this society where we have such high inflation, where we have such high unemployment, where government seems completely 
unable to function properly. So I think mass movements are often a response to some deep instability in society, and people find stability by associating themselves with a political movement, whether of the left or of the right, that claims to have some type of program that will restore uh, will restore a type of stability or realize a type of justice that that human beings I think are naturally inclined to, to to pursue. Most people want to be just. They want to live in just societies where things are fair. And I think that many mass movements, precisely because they promise particular types of justice. So the Marxists, it's a type of, well, we're going to resolve clearly the deep injustices that mark the economy of our society. Or if you're a Nazi, we're going to address the deep injustices that come from the fact that the German people have been downtrodden by foreigners and by internal enemies like the Jews for centuries, etc., etc. That's very attractive. That type of message can be very, very attractive for a lot of young people who are looking for purpose, who are looking for a, a way of understanding the world that makes sense of the apparent chaos in which they happen to be living. So we shouldn't be surprised by this. There's also the fact that many of these movements promise types of utopias. They promise a type of perfect world. Now, if you're a young person and you look around and you see, well, there's a lot of imperfections in the world. And your natural instinct, particularly if you're young and you, particularly if you don't necessarily have um, uh, years of experience of dealing with real people in the real world over different pe long periods of time, it's natural to think, well, if only we could put these, this group in charge, then we could realize a type of heaven on earth. That's very characteristic of people who are attracted to socialism it was characteristic of a lot of people who were attracted to National Socialism because the National Socialists were promising a type of racial utopia in which the Aryan race will be finally recognized for the great and superior people that they are. Or the Marxists, when they say, finally, we'll get to the point where we've abolished all these terrible class distinctions based upon people's economic um, status, and we will create a world in which, as Marx said, people can read, fish, and eat as they choose, not having to worry about work, not having to worry about prices, not having to worry about things being productive, etc. So I think it's not surprising that these type of mass movements are very, um, are very adept at capturing mass support, either from people who are youthful idealists or people who are deeply angry about the status quo in which they find themselves. So what do you think are the threats to liberty and to civilization and to reason that we see around us now? I'm sure many people sitting here in this audience can think about many comparisons. How do you see the world that we live in today? What are the kinds of parallels with Rupke's world? Well, the, and we've talked about this already. The emergence of group identity politics, which you find on certainly on the left, it's trapped. It's wrapped up in the language of diversity, but it's actually not about diversity in the older sense of that word. It's not about pluralism. It's about you are defined by the group that you belong to. So in diversity world, there's no such thing as a black conservative woman, right? That doesn't exist in diversity world, because if you are black, then you must be assumed to hold this, these certain positions. Otherwise, you're clearly f suffering from some form of false consciousness. If you're a white male uh, like me, then clearly you are part of an oppressor group, right? They even use this type of language, oppressed yes. and oppressive. So mm -hmm. by definition, I am the epitome of an oppressor, right? Um, you're not quite as oppressive as I am, Kate, but you're not far from it either. Not far. Not right. So, <laughs> so, so that, that type of group identity and the us and them friends and enemy language that you find very much on the left, but I would say now you find on some parts of the right, to the extent that they have adopted this friends, enemies language, mm -hmm. in which they're saying things like, let's use Machiavellian means to achieve Aristotelian ends. It's that same type of logic, highly conflictual, 
highly viewing the world in terms of them and us, and it's a battle, and one of us has to win, which means there are winners and losers. So that type of that type of group thinking, that focus upon identity as the source of who you are, rather than thinking about people as individuals who have particular attachments, who have particular backgrounds, but nonetheless make choices that define who they are as individuals rather than as just uh, anonymous members of groups. I think that's a major uh, threat to freedom. I think also the, um, uh, the recourse to emotivism as a form of political discourse, because once you start saying things like, well, I, my politics, my view of the world is primarily informed and shaped by my feelings and emotions, then you can't have a rational discussion anymore because it's just my feelings versus your feelings versus everyone else's feelings. That's not a rational basis for arriving at agreement about things that often people vehemently disagree about. Um, I also think that something that Rupke worried about, the disregard for what, let's call it liberal constitutionalism, and the free society, which I think is rampant on the on the left, but also manifest on parts of the rights on the right now. If you have people who see constitutionalism, liberal constitutionalism, as it emerged towards the end of the 18th century, if you see people who see this as destructive, as hedonistic, as leading to a breakdown in society, once you sweep away liberal constitutionalism, then by definition concerns for liberty and rule of law and equality before the law and the need to limit government power, all those things are swept aside. And I see a lot of people on the left and the right who basically don't value these things anymore. Uh, so in some respects, some of the things we're coping with now, uh, they're not quite the same as the sorts of challenges that people like Rob Key and Hayek and others were confronting in the 1930s. And I wouldn't want to say that the parallels are exact. I don't think they are exact. But we do see some parallels precisely because these challenges seem to emerge at regular intervals uh, at different times in, in the West. We saw this in the 1960s and particularly in 1968 when we saw the, the student movements basically wanting to tear everything down and uh, start the world anew, so to speak. It's that type of thinking and the, and the way that class thinking and the way that the the determination to try and group everyone in particular identities, men versus women, um, be religious believers versus non-religious believers, um, uh, working class versus middle class, black versus white, et cetera, et cetera. It seems like we go through these stages at different points. And then we come out at the other end and we realize, okay, that doesn't work. There's all sorts of problems with that. And then 20 years later, we get back into the same cycle. So mm. it's not quite the same par parallels to, uh, uh, to 1930s Germany. We're, I don't think we're living in what might, some people would call a, a Weimar moment. But many of the same dynamics and patterns are certainly present. And that doesn't mean we're going to end up in dictatorships or anything like that. But it does make us, I think, pause and realize just how fragile the civilization of natural liberty really is and why people need, like people like Robke and Hayek did in the 1930s, to recommit themselves to defending that, even if it is often a very lonely position to find yourself in. I think it was Alexis de Tocqueville who talked about true friends of liberty always being a very small group of people. And I think that was true in his time, and I think it's true in our time as well. Well, you kind of just answered a little bit my last question I had in my mind, which is what is the antidote to this kind of groupthink, to this, you know, collectivism, uh, to these mm -hmm. cycles that come of these kinds of bad ideas that people repeat over and over? Because, of course, uh, you know, it's not all doom and gloom because that would be nihilistic as well to just think like the world is crashing downhill and there's nothing we can do about it. There there must be some things that we can do uh, about the illiberal tendencies that we see around us. Um, so are there any last ones that you want to add in the mix there? Well, at AIER, we're doing a lot in this area. We have a whole vertical, a whole program, which is focused upon identifying the new forms of collectivism that have emerged on the right and the left. 
whether it's economic nationalism, whether it's stakeholder capitalism, whether it's ESG, whether it's attempts on the right and the left to expand the reach of government into the economy. There's lots of things happening in that area and lots of good work, I think, being done in pushing back against those things. There's also, I think, another way of dealing with this is to go back to the roots, to go back to the roots of the current disorder, whether it's um, we can find this in history, whether we can find this in particular philosophical movements, ideas, etc., but also going back to those roots that I think are at the core of what Western civilization is all about. And we've already talked about some of these roots, the Greek and Romans, uh, the Greek and Roman experience, um, the religions Stoics. of... Stoics, right, and Robke talks about them all the time. Traditions of natural law, traditions associated with people like um, uh, Cicero and Aristotle. Then there's the different religious traditions that have marked the West. And then there's also the different Enlightenment traditions, which we can turn to and say, yes, the Scottish Enlightenment people were certainly onto something in the way that they talked about the world and the way that they understood the world. Th that's the great thing about, um, I think, about the West, so to speak, is that when it returns to these roots and asks itself, are we being faithful to these things? Are we bringing these insights to the problems of the present? Uh, the West has a tremendous capacity to renew itself. And I think that the more that we look back on these sources and identify the good things in them and then bring those insights to bear on the present, then we're not just articulating um, a message of collectivism is bad because collectivism is bad, we're all saying, also saying, but here's this tradition of liberty, which is so important to who we are and which opens up the prospects of many good things in the future, despite the fact that we are fallible, that we are limited, that we do make mistakes. As long as we're willing to go back and look at that heritage, which uh, I think has so much richness to offer, we have reasons to be hopeful. That was very well said, Samuel, Greg. Thank you so much for being here. People can also read about your ideas in your newsletters for AIER, your work uh, at various outlets, and your book, The New American Economy, which is just Next fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> the next American economy. I was literally thinking next, and then I said new. So sorry about that. Um, but that's it's a great book, and you know it's it's really spoken in a language that uh, speaks to regular individuals who who want to learn about economics, but also the other kind of philosophical ideas that support liberty. And I think most importantly, um, now in this kind of era where people are kind of confused about what they can do, they just see themselves maybe as being helpless and kind of uh, victims of their circumstances because the world just seems so crazy. Uh, there are certain things that you can do as an individual to flourish uh, despite whatever the external circumstances are. And um, maybe the, those uh, individuals making those decisions can actually pan out into a world that renews itself. I agree. So thanks for having me on, Kate. Thanks so much, Sam. <laughs>